Amen, amen. The Jesus effect. Now, uh, as I stated earlier, there certainly is a very real and consistent struggle that all of us, I think, may have and could have and do have when we are talking about the process that is necessary for us to truly integrate Jesus in every part of our lives. Now, certainly, while we're here at church, it is an easier process, depending on who you sit next to every week, amen, uh, depending on which ministry you may be working in, uh, depending on who you linked up with, uh, I think it becomes easier to really feel like Jesus is penetrating the parts of your life that sometimes we have a keep out sign. Hello, somebody. If we keep it real, uh, we, we, we would acknowledge that there are more parts of our lives or certain parts of our lives where Jesus has free reign. Where we don't mind Jesus kind of poking Jesus' nose in that part of our life. We don't mind the spirit convicting us and working on us and, and, and calling out to us. Uh, but how many of you know there's another part of your life? May not be many, many parts you're aware of, but there are a couple places in the walk of the believer, the life of the believer, I think at every stage of your development where you have a implicit or explicit keep out sign. Where, you know, Jesus is not as welcome there as he is somewhere else. Do I have a real church in here today? Amen. And, you know, it, it, it is the struggle, I believe, to, to really let Jesus have full course, full reign in our lives. And part of what I believe the, the lifelong challenge of the believer, uh, of we who are following the ways of Jesus is to really internalize every part of the message and the life of Jesus because it is that process of internalization that will yield the greatest life both here and to come that we could ever imagine. Now be clear, there is always a competition for this kind of process in our lives because the vortex that we can often get caught in of the right now struggle, the vortex of the, the, the crisis that is happening in real time, the vortex, the gravity well, if you will, of, of the trials and the tribulations that we're dealing with can often cause us to ask some serious questions about can Jesus or the ways of Jesus or me following Jesus really cause the result that I am looking for? Because you can look around at some other folk and you can see that their response or the way they may deal with some of these things is a little different than how, as we say, what would Jesus do? And, and, and how many of you know uh, what would Jesus do and what we would do are often diametrically opposed. Hello, somebody. Amen. You know, there's some, 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 some folk, amen, that, that, that know how to, how to cause you to remember how much you need to pray. <laughs> there's some circumstances, the presence of evil, the presence of, 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 of hatred and violence, all kinds of things that will, will cause you to start to be like, man, this is, Lord, are, are you really at work and are you, are you absent? Man, these are questions that have been asked for millennia. People always asking, God, where are you? Did anybody ask, ask that question in, you know, the back of your mind? Because I know none of us would dare form our lips. Amen. Vocalize. Talk about, God, where are you? Amen. You just think it while you're laying in your bed with the lights off under your pillow crying. Mm -hmm. Understand, my brothers, this is that this process of internalizing Jesus, I think, is the powerful process that yields the most uh, 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 
uh, uh, uh, uh, in, in, in infectious Jesus effect. It is the way and the path by which you and I are able to experience not just the effect that Jesus has personally, but the effect that Jesus has communally and 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 interpersonally and 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 in the world and the situations around us. I, I love the 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 Saint Augustine, uh, uh, Augustine, Saint Augustine, Saint Augustine, the the North African Church Father. He says it like this. I, I think I have this slide. It says, "To fall in love with God is the greatest romance. To seek Him, the greatest adventure. To find Him." the greatest human achievement. Now, I, I, just, I, I just want you to sit with that for a second. Th this idea that, that there is a pursuit of God that can yield to our lives the greatest romance we've ever known. Now, now be clear, my brothers and sisters, that, that this kind of romance is, is often uh, uh, very different than the kind of romance that that we see on, you know, the, 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 the soap operas or in our romance novels, in our own kind of, you know, Don Juan pursuits of, of, of that uh, a significant other. Uh, this kind of romance is a romance of your soul, of your spirit, of the very thing that will outlast your body. That God is trying to get in touch with a part of you that you are often paying the least amount of, tent of attention to. And how many of you know that, uh, you know, somebody that don't pay a lot of attention to you uh, will have a, a whole lot of a different, smaller impact than someone who does? I remember, amen, you know, when I, I was starting to, 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 you know, express my affection for Sharice, uh, you know, uh, we, we had already known each other, uh, but our, 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 our interactions were quite different, amen, uh, than when I started to call her uh, every day, praise the Lord. And, uh, you know, it's trying to, you know, pop up in places where I, you know, thought she would be, amen. I, I, I want to believe that the kind of attention that I showed her made her have a little bit of a, uh, you know, uh, uh, blinder around all these other brothers, praise the Lord, <laughs> who weren't showing her the kind of attention. Mm -hmm. Y'all understand what I'm saying in here, amen. That, that all attention is not created equal. And that there are parts of our lives that can become aflamed, caught on fire, when attention is applied to it. Augustine, he says another place that our hearts will never be at rest until they find their rest in God. That there is a place where God wants you to have him moving so intentionally in, in, in your life where it is more than just a cursory glance Sunday morning worship service. It is more than the, 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 the regularly scheduled crisis. Somebody dies. You can't pay your bills. You, 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 you end up in a mess. God is trying to get in a romance situation with you that it will begin to infiltrate the very being of who you are. So much so that even when you don't think God is around, you can feel or you can know or you can be convinced that God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. But God is always giving you the necessary attention you need. Somebody holler, oh, great romance. Uh, the, the, the other thing, the other thing, he took it off the screen. I don't even know what I'm talking about. The other thing he says that he wants to, if you seek him, it will be the greatest adventure. And how many of you know, for all us adrenaline junkies, there is no greater adventure than pursuing God. Amen. Now, now I, I know that some of us, uh, you know, the way we understand Christian faith, we find it to be something quite boring and something quite uh, thrill-less. But I have found that when I follow Jesus, Jesus leads me down pathways I regularly would not go. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, people ask me all the time, you know, uh, aren't you a preacher? Why is it that you are 
involved in all of these different kinds of things. And, 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 and one, 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 one mentor friend of mine, he reminded me, he said, uh, you know, uh, McBride, uh, the, if, if, if God was or if people were going to choose the kind of uh, figures or, or persons to do the, the great divine work of God, they would not choose you. And, you know, I thought about that. I said, I think you just insulted me, praise God. But then he took me back, amen, and, and throughout scripture, and it was rarely the people of high esteem, the people of great power and privilege that God chose to use. God always seemed to choose those who were thought to have been the least. God chose a 16-year-old single young woman who was engaged to be married to be the God bearer. God chose a harlot prostitute by the name of Rahab to save a whole generation of people. God chose a leper to, to, to demonstrate that, that your position means nothing when you are in need of God. God chose a country that was the smallest in the region to demonstrate that there is no power or no number that can outnumber the people of God when God is on your side. I love how Bishop Blake says, he says that me and God always make up a majority. And you ought to be excited about that today because when God is inside of you and when God is inhabiting your life and your circumstance, you automatically become a majority. Lord, help me in here today. Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't have some situations where you feel like you are a minority. Amen. In this country, you know, they assign that, that figure to people of color and say that we are a minority and, and it denotes a certain kind of, 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 of power dynamic that, that, that you don't have the kind of, of, of tipping point and threshold necessary to achieve, you know, the ability of self-determination. But how many of you know when God is with you, Lord, my God, when you have internalized the power and the truth of who God is, it matters not what the enemy does. It matters not what the enemy brings your way because you and God automatically become a majority. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I'm glad I'm in the majority. Amen. Uh, and then the last thing it says that finding God will be your greatest human achievement. Now, this, this is an important, uh, 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 I believe, uh, 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 thought because uh, how many of you know that, that uh, many of us are competing our whole lives for trophies? Amen, amen. We go to school so we can get that degree. Amen. We work on our job so we can get that promotion. Amen. Some of us, our old warped way of thinking, uh, we, we even get in relationships so we can have certain kinds of, 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 of eye candy. Amen. Uh huh. I, and it ain't just relegated to the brothers. Amen. I was in London with some folk. Amen. And, and we, we sitting there eating and, and a sister, you know, was talking to another sister, you know, in our, in our crowd. And, and, and she said, do you appreciate eye candy talking to the other sister? And I didn't know what they was talking about because I thought only God said that kind of stuff. Amen. Sometimes, except when you single, when you married, well, you, you know what I mean. Amen. And, 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 and they look and there's this guy, you know, Mount Olympus, walking down the street with his shirt off, showing off. I wanted to throw my hot dog at him and just knock him up the side of the head. Say, man, go and put your stuff away, amen. You making it hard on the rest of us, amen. Uh, we, 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 we all got our, our, our pursuit of human achievement. But don't you know that you can find and gain the whole world and still not have fulfillment in your soul. And part of this process that I want to lift up for us as we are 
talking about internalizing Jesus, I want you to understand that all of the things that are happening in the world today, there is a Jesus effect that the people of God must bring into the conversation. And it is not a, 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 a contribution or an injection that has to be one used or, or necessarily depending on force, on imperialism, Amen. But how many of you know when you bring Jesus and the ways of Jesus into any situation, that situation changes. Amen. Amen. I mean, think of the ways in which Jesus, this is one person uh, born in an unimportant part of the Roman Empire to an unimportant people in the Roman Empire. And through the subversive ways of his life. He destabilized a whole way of being, a whole way of seeing the world. Jesus did not come in on a chariot with a whole lot of armies and, and forces. And, and, but Jesus came in and Jesus had a priority of being with people. The subversive ways of Jesus, the incarnatability of Jesus Life is a paradigm for how Jesus wants us to internalize him. That when you make Jesus alive inside of you, it will manifest itself in a way that becomes subversive without you even trying to be subversive. Mm -mm. Uh, I, I, I know that we are in a full-fledged moment of revolution, amen, and everybody is talking about how the state is all falling apart, and uh, you got political scientists talking about the crumbling of the American uh, 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 power in the world. You got economists talking about how the economy is on the brink of some kind of catastrophe. You have our social unrest. You have all of these kind of destabilizing identities, and I want to let you know that one of the great contributions the church can make is to bring and internalize Jesus into the public square because just being like Jesus will turn everything upside down Lord help me think about how Jesus in this passage uh, 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 what he did before he started to teach Jesus Jesus was feeding the 5,000 if you read earlier up in John chapter 6, the ways of Jesus all the way through his life, the way he turned the empire upside down was by feeding folk, healing folk, bringing folk who are often outside the circle of acceptance, bringing them right into the middle. He hung out with some thugs and some some prostitutes and 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 some rich folk and Jesus was was a kind of character that was always at home wherever he was think about that for a second because how many of you know that we don't feel at home in a whole lot of places amen amen uh, we, we, we 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 always putting up barriers to keep folk out of our home I remember I was watching that Michael Moore movie and they was talking about how folk in Canada don't lock their doors at night. And, and, and they asked the question, why don't you lock your door? And they said, well, if I lock my door, people can't come in. And I'm saying, that, that's kind of the point, praise God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I don't need, I don't need, you know, Pookie asked me for a cup of sugar at two in the morning, praise the Lord. Amen. Why? Because we have been shaped to lock people out. But imagine what would it look like if the subversive nature of being and following the ways of Jesus always caused our lives to be able to bring and be at home wherever we are. The Jesus effect to me is and to us, I think, is this ability to find out God. How can I? And this is my first point. Be in alignment with you. That's the first thing we're going to talk about. The Jesus effect creates alignment. Somebody holler alignment. Verse 
35, it says, whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the other version, it says, whoever aligns with me will never be hungry or thirsty. My brothers and sisters, sometimes this perpetual state of hunger we are in, this always kind of state of needing to our thirst and our desire satiated is often a reflection that we are not in right alignment with God, with the creation, and with the people that God has given to us as a gift. Now, if you take seriously what misalignment or unalignment will do, we would talk and think differently about this. Now, our, if you own a car, amen, you know that if you do not align your, your wheels, that you can drive on your wheels all you want to, and you know, I mean, this is a good, a good, a good uh, test. If you're driving on the freeway, and you take your hands off the wheel, just for a few seconds, I mean, I'm not telling you to act like you got Kit and the Knight Rider and all that kind of stuff, but, but, but you know, your car should, should, should be able to, you know, drive if your wheels are in perfect alignment at relatively straight. But if you take your hands off the wheel and your car makes a sharp right turn, <laughs> That means you are not in alignment. Now, what else happens to your car if you're not in alignment? Well, if you look at the tires on your wheel, your wheels begin to get warped because you're out of alignment. The rubber on your wheels is burning and friction and all the kind of pressure is starting to turn that thing which has been engineered to perfection. It is causing it to now be defected. When we are not in right alignment with God, with creation, and with the, the people that God has given to us, we turn that which has been engineered to perfection into something that is defected. And this is what is wrong with the world. This is what is wrong with our country. Injustice persists because we are not in right alignment with God, with creation, and with the people that God has given to us as a gift. Hello, somebody. Amen. I'm going to get to the gift point next, but let me tell you a little bit about what this uh, alignment looks like. Because for many of us, we often are able to name the sins of misalignment, but not often deal with the root causes of misalignment. And at the end of the day, my brothers and sisters, our, our ability to not be in alignment with God, creation, and others is largely a function of our inability to appreciate our origins. Our origins, you are not created for your own end. This world, creation, has not been created for its own end. But God created the world. The origins of this world, of our lives, has its ultimate origin in God. And when you and I forget who we come from, then the scripture says uh, in the book of Judges, they were all finding themselves in a whole lot of messed up stuff. And every chapter they're about in the book of Judges, it says like this. And the children did what was evil in the sight of the Lord because they forgot their God. And then God sent to judge and, you know, Deborah, mighty woman, sister. And I'm so glad we got all these women warriors. Amen. Raising up all over the place because some of us brothers, we just out the lunch. Praise the Lord. Amen. God's raising up all these sister warriors to help judge and redirect us back into right relationship. But guess what? After a generation, the children of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord because they forgot their God. And then God sent another judge, Samson, and God sent another judge, Gideon, and on and on and on and on. 
My brothers and sisters, uh, never forget, never forget that God wants you and I to have an awareness of our origins. Why? Because if you can keep seeking out God, God will show you some stuff. On the screen, Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, the scripture says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Now, it is hard for you and I to be in alignment with God when we don't even know what God is trying to teach and show us. It's almost like you're trying to put, amen, I don't know how many of y'all do this, uh, Pastor Phil and, and Pastor Grace, I watch them, they are, are the D, DIY, do-it-yourself, and Brother Marcel is too, these, these folk, amen. They don't even use instructions, amen, they just, they look at the cover, and five minutes later, the thing is put apart. It's like they got some kind of Vulcan mind meld or something with, with, with the product. Amen. Uh, not all of us are like that. Somebody say amen, right? Some of us, even with the instructions, the thing will look like, you know, uh, 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 you know Frankenstein or something like that. It's like, man, this is not how it looked on the shelf. Some of us have to seek out God with more passion and consistency and intentionality if we are going to be in alignment with God. Because the competition out here for who you will align with is real. And the struggle is real. Amen, amen. And, and you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm all for the fights of, for justice and I'm all for the fights of liberation and I'm all for the fight. But, 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 but sometimes uh, somebody's justice can be my bondage if I'm not in right alignment with the God of justice. Amen. Amen. Uh, the Oath Keeper showed up in Ferguson last week and, you know, these some fellas out here who was actually shooting at us last year, amen, after the Mike Brown uh, uh, a verdict, and they have a notion of justice, and they have a notion of justice to walk around with guns, amen. Not to even say anything about it, we showed up with some guns, amen. Uh, you know, I could legally carry me a gun, praise God, but I know if I showed up at Ferguson with my clergy collar on and my gun, I'd be a dead preacher with a clergy collar on and my gun. Somebody shout hallelujah, right? The kind of privilege and the kind of audacity to show up walking up and down the street, militarized vehicles on one side of the street, uh, soldiers from the National Guard on one side of the street, police officers with their riot gear on one side of the street, and then these four or five white guys walking up and down the street with military fatigue zone and their weapons. And I was saying to myself, now I could probably follow their brand of justice. But what does God have to say about that kind of brand of justice? I don't know. I mean, you know, there is a contested narrative within Christian faith about the role of violence, amen, in liberation struggles. Because, you know, there were some Christians, amen, who fought using violence. Denmark Vesey, amen. Uh, I mentioned this, you know, if I die in custody, I told y'all to read Nat Turner, amen. And some of y'all don't know who he is, but Nat Turner was one of them Christians who believe in, you know, fighting to the blood, amen. Amen. Some of us are like that in here. Y'all just undercover, praise God. And I thank God for you, quiet as it's kept. No, I'm just playing. Uh, 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 what, what, what's the point? The point is, I believe that there is a certain kind of, of wrestling with seeking after God so God can show us things that we do not know. Because I believe there's some things you and I don't know that are causing our lives to be out of alignment with God. But I love when Jesus says, blessed are you that hunger and thirst for righteousness. For you will be filled, you will be satisfied. The alignment of our lives with God is directly connected to the extent to which we will hunger and thirst for God. Don't let your life become so hungry and thirsty for the things that are not godly. That they create godlessness in you, in me. Because Jesus said it like this, our enemy the devil is like a 
roaring lion, seeking. He's, he's on the prowl, trying to find who he can devour. But when you win in alignment with God, that lion becomes a toothless cat. Oh, the most, you know, unless you're a cat lover, I don't mean no harm, but cats annoy me. Amen. Always trying to rub up against you and, you know, meow, you know all this kind of stuff and, you know, just, just go somewhere. That's how the devil becomes in your life. Just go somewhere. I know you're around, but just go somewhere. I know you, you lingering, just go somewhere. I know injustice is here, but because I'm in alignment with God, I know trouble is in my house, but because I'm in alignment with God, I know that I have trouble in my body, in my mind, and in my spirit, but because I'm in alignment with God, no weapon that's formed against me will be able to prosper. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, get in alignment, get in alignment, get in alignment. The second thing that I think this scripture lifts up to us if we are going to internalize Jesus is that it helps us, listen, to acknowledge we are a gift and also deal and work on our growing edges. Everybody say gift. Yeah. Everybody say edges. Yeah. Now, the, 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 the contradiction often uh, running amok in modernity is that there is never or very little that you and I have to change about ourselves. We are always preoccupied about everybody else and things outside of us. But how many of you know there's some growing edges that you and I got to be willing? Mm -hmm. Theologically, that's called sanctification. It is the process where God is constantly refining you. God is constantly transforming you and I into the greatest person that God had in God's imagination when God thought of you in the beginning. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4 is one of my favorite scriptures. It says that I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. So part of what you and I have to always start off with is not that we have growing edges. Listen, we need to start off with that you and I are always a gift. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I am a gift, I am a gift, I am a gift. Now, in an age of anti-black sentiment, anti-immigrant sentiment, anti-activist uh, 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 sentiment, anti in all these antis out there, you need to wake up every day and be reminded, listen, that you are a gift. That you have been fearfully and wonderfully made. That within you, God has put the footprint or the thumbprint of the divine. That even at your worst moment, you're still a gift. At your most unbelieving moment, you are still a gift. At your highest height, you are still a gift. At your brokest moment, you're still a gift. At your most addictive moment, you are still a gift. At your most depressed moment, you are still a gift. At your most out of the sorts kind of isolated moment, you are still a gift. Why? Because you have been given to the world by God. I don't want to become so overdetermined by scientific descriptions of our origins and of the universe. That I lose the truth that God has given you to me and me to you as a gift. Because when you have been given to someone as a gift, how many of you know it always is a reflection of the giver? Now, I got to keep it real. There's some folk in this world who I think the devil gave to me. <laughs> uh, touch your neighbor, somebody, and tell them I'm not talking about you, though, praise God. 
Do I have a witness in here today? There's some folk out here that you just got, you just know, Lord, I don't know what God was thinking about when God caused him or her to come walking into my life. But the reason why you have to keep remembering that they are a gift is because it keeps you being the gift that you are. Folk can drag you down to their level and have you just as mean and hateful and nasty and violent and, and, and unjust and, 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 and ugly. Did I say mean already? Amen. And they will drag you out of your giftedness. So much so that then you can't internalize Jesus because you internalizing all that negativity. So what I try to do when I meet folk who I feel have been given to me as a gift by the devil. <laughs> Listen, this is going to help somebody. I create a barrier or a boundary. And in the middle of that boundary, or my boundary is often made up of a few characteristics. One is often called grace. One is called no. Mm -hmm. Think about this. These are the boundaries God uses with us. How many know that though magnificent you believe you are, you are still quite a piece of work when you kind of start to stack up standing next to God. The only reason why we are not consumed is because of his grace and mercy, his love for us. How many ever got, had God tell you no about something? Amen. Serving God don't mean God is your sugar daddy, God is your genie. Whatever you say to God, God just does. Sometimes a no is a blessing in your life. So when I meet folk who, who, who don't get it, who aren't, as Nina Simone said, uh, I need to learn to get up from the table when love is no longer being served there. Ooh, that Nina Simone was somebody, y'all. Amen. Some of us need to figure out how do we put good boundaries around it. I'm going to love you from a distance. I'm going to help you from a, you can always help somebody, even your worst enemy, from a distance. You ain't got to be all up in their face waiting for them to stab you in the back. Because that takes away from your giftedness as well. When you are a gift and you know you are a gift and you realize that you always have something to offer and something to give to the world. Why? Because the God that created you and gave you to the world has always need of you. And all the ways in which God will use us will always be different. But don't forget that you are a gift. And part of you being the best gift you can be is making sure that you're dealing, we're dealing with our growing edges. None of us in and of ourselves are all sufficient. God is always trying to help somebody work out some rough edges. Go to counseling. Tell your neighbor, go to counseling. Go to a, a class or two and learn a different skill. Read a book. Take a picture. Write it down. But do something that helps you to work on your growing edges. Why? Because the greatest gift that you can be will only happen when you are working on your growing edges. So you start with this realization that you are a gift, but then you graduate to this realization that every part of my life, there are some things that God is working on. The internalization process of Jesus, I believe, helps you to work on your growing edges. Uh, there was an old song we used to sing, and it said, something on the inside works its way to the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. 
Then another part said, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. You know, the old songs, you just plug on anything in there. Holy Ghost on the inside. Mm -hmm. Oh, them, them, them songs is all right. Amen. Amen. Now we got so many words, we can't even remember what we're talking about. Amen. Amen. You are a gift. And then finally, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be ready to wrap up here. Internalizing Jesus helps you and I live a real life. Everybody holler, real life. Now understand, there is a kind of living that is counterfeit. There is a way of existing in the world. That is always at odds with the reality of who and how God intends for us to be. And we're seeing the glimpses of counterfeit living. And we're seeing the impact of counterfeit living. We're seeing what it looks like to devote your whole life to the building up of earthly kingdoms. When these earthly kingdoms do not have the capacity to deal with the best or the worst of earthly problems. We're seeing what it looks like when our whole pursuit of life is around things. And then you get all the things. And then you still are looking for more things. And even in the tragedies of our life, we see that the, 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 the pursuit of a certain kind of way of living, all kinds of forces outside of our control can compromise the quality of that kind of life. Physical sickness, illness, catastrophe. All these different kinds of forces can easily invade us with or without our permission. But what does it look like to have a kind of life that God offers to us that is a real life? A real life. A life that is not easily dismantled. A life that persists beyond trouble and trial. A life that is grounded in something more sacred than the color of our skin, our national origin, our economic location. A real life. A life that is always reminding us of something greater, something better. Jesus tells his disciples, listen, if you are in alignment with me, I will introduce you to real life. Now, this question of real life, my brothers and sisters, is quite a lifelong quest to answer. Because I have found that in my pursuit of real life, according to the ways of Jesus, I am constantly being challenged, transformed, resurrected, made new, stretched, encouraged, inspired. I am constantly being taught that the things I thought I knew to be true, real life begins to unravel. Jesus, as he comes into our world, bringing this new kingdom, is constantly trying to unravel the conventional wisdom of his day to show a path into a new life, a real life. The scripture goes on to call it eternal life. And eternal life, my brothers and sisters, is more than you living now, dying, and then waking up starting something brand new. But some of the best consistent theological thought about eternal life is the way in which 
following the ways of Jesus cause you to have a trajectory of life that extends past death. It is the way of life that reflects the regeneration process, the process that God is always renewing us. The things that we're working on now that are a part of the real life are propelling us to a kind of life that extends beyond even your physical transition. That when I am pursuing God, my pursuit of God is not limited to when I have breath in my body. My pursuit, my obedience, and my worship to God is not limited to when I, my mind and my money and my friends and my body are all in right functioning and optimal condition. But my pursuit of God, my, 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 my ability to know that life is more than the accumulation of these things and, and the accumulation of these trophies and the accumulation of these positions and the accumulation of wealth that God is trying to unlock something inside of all of us that is eternal. And it is grounded in the beginning practices of worship to God. You see, Jesus, as he gives to us a, a way of life, he tells the disciples things like this. My food, my will is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Meaning that there is a real life assignment that God has given to you that does not have an expiration date on it. I, I spoke a little bit about this a couple weeks ago because many of us are working on things that have an expiration date on it. We're investing in relationships. We're investing in career paths. We're investing in certain kinds of knowledge base that has an expiration date on it, meaning that for whatever reason, this thing will run out. But how many of you know there is an investment you can make in God and in the things of God and in the work of God that have no expiration date on it? Uh, it is like this. It says that you are not working on a kingdom where moth and, and, and corruption can destroy it. Uh, but you're working on something that has an eternal trajectory. Yeah. And part of what I'm trying to help some of us wrestle with this morning is that when you are internalizing the totality of who God is calling us to be, then you don't have any time limit on your assignment to follow God. God, to make God real in the situations around you, but it is a continuous project that you continue not just here, but even in the next life. Uh, you see, when Jesus uh, tells the disciples that I go to prepare a place for you and where I am going, you're going to join me eventually. How many of you know when we get to the other side, it's just going to be a continuation of what we're doing now? But it won't look like fighting for uh, injustice or fighting for a, a, a livable wage, but it will be the truth and the kernel that I believe is grounded in all of that. And for me, listen, the reason why we do all this is we are trying to worship God in spirit and in truth. When you're out there marching, it better be an act of worship. When you are dealing with your children, it better be an act of worship. When you are teaching in the classroom, when you are sitting in the boardroom, when you are trying to figure out how you're going to make all these ends meet, always remember that everything you do in word and deed, it is an act of worship. It is you ascribing to God the goodness of God. It is you giving to God his worthiness. It is you uh, uh, telling and showing and demonstrating uh, that there is nothing more magnanimous, nothing more important, nothing more precious uh, than a life that is lived in service to God. And part of why I want you and I to internalize Jesus uh, is I don't want us to wait too late to get in on this worshiping of God. Uh, I don't want you to wait too late to understand uh, that every step you take in the morning, every step you take at lunchtime, every step you take in the evening uh, is you continuing to worship God. Uh, you continuing to demonstrate that God has been good to you. Uh, that 
that God has made you an instrument of his worship. That as you give God what God desires, as you internalize the truth of who God is, that God will start to be for you that which you cannot be for yourself. Uh, this is why I love Jesus when he says, I am the bread of life. Uh, because he begins to show and remind us uh, that he has a bread uh, that will cause you and I to never hunger again. Uh, he has some water uh, that will never cause you to thirst again. Uh, he has something to give you and I uh, that will address every single part of uh, of your life but if you and I can get in a place where God says I am that I am I will be whatever you need me to be I will do whatever you need me to do I will help you whenever you need my help I will heal you whenever you need my healing I will lift you up whenever you need a good lift I will touch your mind whenever you need a good touch in your mind I will give you a new way of vision and see in the world uh, whenever your eyes become too dim uh, Jesus is saying to somebody let me be your bread of life uh, let me be the thing that sustains you uh, when everything else is falling down around you uh, let me be the very thing that causes you to walk around uh, with a guarantee uh, that even though you may try to knock me out uh, God says that I also am the resurrection and the life uh, which means that even if you take my life devil uh, I serve a God who's able to raise me back up again uh, do I have somebody that can look back over your life and begin to think about the many times uh, that everybody thought you were disqualified. Uh, everybody thought you could not make it back from that situation. Uh, everybody thought that you were down for the count. Uh, they looked at how people walked away from you. Uh, they looked at all the trouble that was in your life. Uh, they looked at all the odds that were stacked against you. Uh, but some kind of a way uh, Jesus stepped in your life uh, and he told you I am the resurrection uh, and the life uh, I will finish what I started in you uh, I will bring you back from the dead uh, I will lift you up out of that death filled situation uh, Jesus is saying I am your resurrection uh, I am your life. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. And the thing that I love the most, uh, he says that when I lift you up, uh, you will be on your feet, uh, whole and alive. Uh, God ain't looking for no walking dead folk, uh, but God wants you to be whole uh, and alive. Uh, nothing lacking. Uh, nothing missing so that means whatever you lost on your way to life God says I'm going to give it back to you I'm going to give it back to you you may have lost a little bit of hope but God says hope is coming back you may have lost a little bit of joy but joy is coming back you may have lost a little bit of love but love is coming back because he said, I am your resurrection. I am your life. I will do what you need me to do. Shout hallelujah, somebody.